Chapter 21 Millions of Mirrors No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Eleanor Roosevelt Activist, feminist, superhero, longest-serving First Lady of the United States ever. One of the most staggering things about other people is that they provide us with valuable and often alarmingly intimate information about who they are as soon as we meet them. If we pay attention, we can pick up on the major clues they're sending out through their body language, their appearance, their lifestyle, their actions, their interests, their words, how they treat their dogs, the waitress, themselves, etc. Some people let it all hang out for everyone to see right away. Others let it seep out in little spurts. I love water skiing. I admire how confident you are about your weight problem. I just got out of prison, etc. With the exception of the sociopath or the skilled pathological liar, the majority of humanity gives us plenty to chew on right out of the gate. All of this information then goes through the filter of who we are, and depending on our perceptions and judgments and hangups and number of years spent in therapy, we decide if the person is someone we want to get to know better or not. We're all attracted to, as well as turned off by, various things about other people. And the things that stand out the most to us are the things that remind us the most of ourselves. This is because other people are like mirrors for us. If somebody bugs you, you're projecting onto them something you don't like about yourself. And if you think they're awesome, they're reflecting back something that you see in yourself that you like, even if it's not developed in you yet. I know this sounds like I'm making a massive generalization, but just stay with me here. Your reality is created by what you focus on and how you choose to interpret it. This goes for everything, including the things you focus on about the people in your world. For example, depending on who you are, you could react in a myriad of different ways to your new boyfriend or girlfriend constantly referring to you as the giant dumbass. You could A, see this as a red flag and think they're a bully, B, see this as a red flag and think they're nervous or insecure and have terrible manners. C, see this as a green light because they're in so much pain that they need to abuse other people. They really need someone as understanding as I am. D, see this as a green light because you believe that you are, in fact, a giant dumbass. Or E, think it's hilarious because it doesn't resonate with you. The people you surround yourself with are excellent mirrors for who you are and how much or how little you love yourself. We attract people into our lives for a reason, just as they attract us into theirs. We all help each other grow and figure out our issues if we seize the opportunity to learn from instead of just react to by getting defensive or justifying our actions or whining about the highly irritating things other people do. It's our annoying friends or family members or clients or neighbors or lady on the train with a voice like a bullhorn who help us grow and see who we truly are, even more than our beloved BFFs do, unless they're being momentarily annoying and then we can thank them too. Don't miss the glorious opportunity to learn that's being handed to you by the person whose mouth you'd really love to stick your fist in. The things that bother us about other people bother us because they remind us of something we don't like about ourselves. Or their behavior triggers a fear or insecurity that we have, but may not realize we have. For the longest time, one of my big stories was that being feminine was weak and annoying. Somewhere along the way, I decided that it wasn't cool or powerful to act like, or be, a girl, and my feminine self became part of me that I was ashamed of. Hence, I was much less threatened by women who came at me with a power drill than women who came at me with an eyebrow pencil, which is why it's pretty hilarious to me still that one of my best friends is as girly as they get. I met her when we were working together in New York City and was instantly drawn to her because she's hilariously brilliant and sweet and did a flawless impression of one of our co-workers walking down the hall with his ass sticking out that always left me doubled over clinging to furniture. Unlike me, however, She's a lover of girls' nights out and mani-pedi dates, an eager ogler of engagement rings when summoned by the fluttering hand of a soon-to-be bride, and a pro at the girly girl gang greeting. 
arms raised high in the air, head back, eyes squeezed shut, high-pitched, oh my God, for all to hear. For this, we call her Pink. A decade later, I'm living in Los Angeles, and Pink is living outside New York City, married with a bunch of kids, Natch. When she decides to take her first solo vacation since becoming a mom and heads to San Diego to see her best friend from college, she calls and begs me to drive down to see her. I agree, somewhat begrudgingly. It wasn't the two-hour drive that bothered me, but the best friend from college, who I'd never met but was sure was pinker than pink. I imagined a full-on sorority scene, complete with painting our toenails while having a Meg Ryan movie fest and talking about how fat we'd gotten. But I love Pink, so off I went. Meanwhile, down in San Diego, Pink's best friend from college is less than thrilled at the prospect of Pink's best gal pal from her New York City days driving down from L.A. Her eyes were also rolling at the potential estrogen bomb, so imagine our delight when we discovered that we were both equally as macho. Once we realized that the playing field wasn't as overwhelmingly pink as we feared it would be, however, we got the biggest surprise of all. Our inner, neglected girls felt safe to come out of hiding. All three of us lost our voices that weekend, cackling and screaming, Oh my God! for all to hear. I wouldn't be surprised if a toenail or two even got painted. Don't remember was too drunk on wine spritzers. I'm still not the most enthused member of a bridal shower, and I'm not saying that you have to come around and like everything in this world that bothers you, but I am saying that if you actively don't like something, it's because it resonates with you on some level. It has meaning to you. When you find yourself dealing with someone who irritates you, and you find yourself getting gossipy, finger pointy, judgy, or complainy, Rising up and confronting the situation can do a hell of a lot more than just make your life more pleasant in the long run. It can help you heal and grow and get out of victim mode because it forces you to deal with the gnarlier aspects of yourself, the parts that make you not so proud. None of us care to admit that we're dishonest, conceited, insecure, unethical, mean, bossy, stupid, lazy, etc., but that's what attracted you to the people you notice it in and them to you in the first place. And admitting it is the first step in letting it go. Whee! If people are annoying in a way that has nothing to do with us, we either don't notice it or we don't get that hung up on it. For example, say there's someone in your life who you find to be an insufferable know-it-all. Every time you open your mouth to talk about something you did, she says she's already done it. Anything you know? she already knows and knows much more about. And she has to make sure you and everyone within a 10 mile radius knows how much more she knows about it. While you find yourself entertaining fantasies about putting her head through the wall every time you're around her, someone else might be hanging on her every word, unable to get enough of her fascinating and brilliant conversation. The reason she makes you so crazy is because you most likely are a know-it-all yourself or you worry that you are one or you have insecurities about people thinking you know nothing. Our reality is a mirror of our thoughts, the people in our reality included. Same thing goes with what people throw at us. Would you be offended if someone kept making fun of how short you were if you were six feet tall? It most likely wouldn't even register. Or if it did, you'd just think they were kind of strange. But if they teased you about being bossy and deep down you feared you were, it would definitely get your attention. It would also mean they have energy around their own bossiness if they're recognizing it in you, but that's not your problem. What you focus on, you create more of in your life. If you're consciously or subconsciously focused on certain beliefs about who you are or who you wanna be or who you do not wanna be, you will attract people who mirror those traits right back at you. This is why when you're dealing with a backstabbing quote unquote friend, or some sort of toxic person that you need to stand up to or kick out of your life, you get caught up in this self-inflicted trap of not wanting to hurt the other person or latching onto their finer qualities or fearing the worst if you don't put up with their crap. I don't care how long you've been friends with someone or how sorry you feel for them or how they really helped you those 8 million times or how hilarious, successful, hot, inspiring, desperate, scary, connected, brilliant, or helpless they are, 
because the reason you're having trouble standing up to them isn't about any of that. What's really going on is you're being faced with rewiring your limiting beliefs about yourself. And you're using these excuses for these other people to avoid facing your own issues, your own issues around sticking up for yourself. At the end of the day, it's not about them. It's about you believing you're worthy of being loved and seen for who you really are. When we agree to let ourselves down in favor of supporting the bad behavior of others, it often stems from the same impulse. We're unwilling to make other people more uncomfortable than they just made us. Not terribly studly in the old self-love department, is it? By making them uncomfortable, I mean declining to participate in their drama, by the way, not by being equally abusive back. This isn't about getting an eye for an eye and sinking to a lower level. It's about standing up for your highest self, no matter if the person you're dealing with should choose to have the experience of feeling disappointed, feeling hurt, feeling inconvenienced, seeing you as a crazy person. It's about respecting yourself instead of catering to your insecure need to be liked. This is incredibly powerful because when you love yourself enough to stand in your truth, no matter what the cost, everyone benefits. You start attracting the kinds of things, people, and opportunities that are in alignment with who you truly are, which is way more fun than hanging out with a bunch of irritating energy suckers. And by declining to participate in other people's drama, i.e. refusing to rip people to shreds, to complain about how unfair the world is, etc. You not only raise your own frequency, but you offer the drama queens the chance to rise up too, instead of everyone continuing to play a low, lame game. Never apologize for who you are. It lets the whole world down. We all know someone who does not take shit from anyone. Ever. We look upon these types of people with wide-eyed reverence, and would never dream of being stupid enough to present them with any of our own BS or try to make them wrong. Why? Because we respect them and, um, are usually kind of terrified of them in a healthy way. And why do we respect them? Because they respect themselves. So how can you get rid of your lame-o projections and judgments and grace the world with your highest, most unapologetic self? One, own your ugly. Start noticing the things that drive you nuts about other people, and instead of complaining or judging or getting defensive about them, use them as a mirror. Especially if you find yourself getting really worked up. Get mighty real with yourself. Is this quality something you have yourself? Or is there a certain aspect to it that you're loath to admit is just like you? Or does it remind you of something you're actively trying to suppress? or avoid, or that you're actively doing just the opposite of, or that you're threatened by. Become fascinated by, instead of furious about, the irritants surrounding you, and go get your learning on. 2. Question your ugly. Once you discover what part of yourself you're projecting onto the person who is presently bugging the living crap out of you, you can start letting it go. Begin by asking yourself some very simple questions and diffusing the limiting and false stories you've been lugging around for ages. For example, if you're all pissed off that your friend who's always late is late again, it's pushing your buttons because you're holding onto some sort of quote unquote truth about the way people should be with time. Flip it around and ask yourself things like, in what ways am I always late or inconsiderate or unreliable? Or maybe it's, in what ways am I too rigid or controlling? Once you have your answer, ask yourself, who do I need to be for this situation not to bother me? Using this scenario, let's say you discover that you're a lot more rigid than you care to admit. This is very valuable information because now you know that in order to be happier, you need to loosen your bone, Wilma. Stop insisting that people do things exactly the way you do them especially the people in your life who have proven they most definitely won't. Notice where you're being ridiculously demanding simply because it's become your habit and not because it's really necessary. And constantly ask yourself, can I let this one go? By becoming aware of what we do, we can investigate why we do it and then choose to keep it or drop it 
instead of blindly reacting through habit. What am I getting out of being this way? As discussed in Chapter 17, it's so easy once you figure out it isn't hard. We don't do anything unless we're getting something out of it, even if what we're getting are false benefits. Using this scenario, some of the positive benefits of being rigid are that you're always on time, you get shit done, etc. But there are also some negative advantages to being rigid too. You intimidate people into getting your way, you get to be right whenever someone messes up, which they'll do often if you've really honed the rigid thing well. You get to be in control, etc. Once you bust yourself on the false reward you're getting from holding on to this behavior, you can see it for what it is, something that's not always in alignment with who you truly are and aspire to be, and release it when it's not working. How would I feel if I wasn't this way? One of the best ways to release the aforementioned lousy behavior is by asking yourself how you'd feel if this wasn't true for you anymore. How would I feel if I took the pull out of my ass about everyone doing everything exactly how I say to do it all the time in every circumstance? Ask the question and then imagine yourself as this person who has let it go. How does your body feel? What do you use the brain space for that used to be taken up with poisonous thoughts about the inconsiderate pinheads you're surrounded by who are not following your instructions? Feel into the reality of what it would be like to let this go. Breathe into it. Visualize it. Fall in love with not having it anymore. And then kick it to the curb. 3. Don't be an enabler. In the fuzzier cases where you're not sure what to do, but you really do want to help someone, recognize the difference between helping and enabling. When you reach out a helping hand, do you feel like they're pulling you down or that you're lifting them up towards their potential? Are they grateful or entitled? Do they use your help to actively move themselves in a positive direction? Or do they constantly need more, more, more? Just this one last time. For the 50th time. Pay attention and trust how you feel. If you're truly helping them and they're rising to the occasion, it will raise everyone's frequencies and you'll feel good. If you're enabling them, you'll feel heavy, depressed, and eventually resentful. While it's no fun to kick someone to the curb when they're at their lowest low, if you constantly bail them out, they'll never wake up and save themselves. Why should they? They've got you to fund their pity party. Tough love is still love. 4. Give painful people the heave-ho. Sometimes, no matter how much work you do on yourself and how forgiving you are and how skilled you get at letting it go, there's just no way around it. Some people are just too committed to their own dysfunction. They're painful to be around. You'd rather cover yourself in the fleas of a thousand camels than go out for a cup of coffee with them. This is all about learning and loving and growing into the highest version of yourself, not seeing just how much torture you can endure. So along with understanding how to grow from the not-so-savory behavior of those around you, it's also important to understand how to get the hell away from them if they're chronically self-obsessed or violent or blaming or negative or controlling or jealous or high drama or manipulative or victimized or whiny or pessimistic or mean to animals. Here's how. First, feed your head. As discussed, a lot of times the people we need to kick to the curb happen to be those we love, or at least like a lot for their decent qualities. Hence, ye olde guilt can really get in our way when trying to do the right thing. So stay strong. See it as being nice to yourself instead of being mean to them. Remembering that you are rising up to the highest version of yourself instead of shrinking down to their level can give you the strength you need to shake them off your leg. Next, hit eject. Another important thing to remember when yanking the weeds out of your garden is not to get involved in their drama. Cut the cord as quickly and simply as possible with little to no discussion. If they're so oblivious to your feelings that you need to toss them out of your life, chances are very good they won't see this coming. So the discussion on why you need to end it could go on for the rest of your lives if you let it. Suddenly get really busy. Fade them out. Wean them off you with zero explanation. The louder they scream, the busier you suddenly get. If having a conversation is unavoidable, remember, you've already decided that you want out. 
So don't get sucked into working through your decision or their problems with them. Simply say that the relationship isn't working for you, that you don't like how it makes you feel, that you have to end it, and that it's not open for discussion. Make it all about you. Give them nothing to work with or argue about. Five, love yourself. Fiercely, loyally, unapologetically. <laughs> 